Are you are you doing a lot of podcasts right now? Or are you in a, a more in it phase or out of it phase? I am in a um, I am in a quite shocking. Uh, there's been a, what I would say is a yeah I think I stick with that word uh, increase <laughs> in demand for the kind of work I do compared mm. to like pre pandemic levels. I, I, I've been saying for the last sort of two or three months, I've been saying, well, oh, it's double, double. And actually, it's it's more than that. I, I actually think it's really literally triple. And in terms of like leads and just pe- companies going, come to this thing. It, it, uh, it's um, I'm not just I'm, I'm not I'm not just trying to say, oh, yes, you know, good for me. Yeah. I, hopefully I'm not even saying that at all. I, no, I just think no. it's I think it's. I really think it's fascinating um, yes. what what is going on, and I can't quite name all the pieces because it's multi multifaceted. But I mean, pre pandemic, right? There wasn't the second book. There wasn't effortless, and so I think the combination of essentialism and effortless has a certain synergistic effect that I didn't expect. Mm. I mean, of course, I saw them as related. I mean, that's not like some surprise, but. But I think there's an it, it, it's it's shaped the content differently for people. So it, it it's it's combined met the moment of mm. burnout and well being. It, it's sort of it's moved into that category rather than the past of more like oh essentialism. People thought more to do with the productivity category, and it's yes. not like my thinking has changed. But I think the way people think about it may have just altered in a way that's relevant in this moment and i think it may be a combination of that and then plus these companies are getting all their pulse scores in mm-hmm. and they're low under these categories under wellness i was just having a conversation right before you and i were speaking uh, with a you know major branded um u.s based company uh, global offices and they were saying yes this region we're talking about a specific region that's the lowest scores, maybe maybe 30 to 35 percent of the employees will think that they can have good well-being and work <laughs> at this company. You know, like so that kind of number. And they were talking about where it was in the world. And, and I, I was like, man, I feel like I just had this conversation with you. This is so surreal. Like, why, why do I think that? And, it, and I remembered there was another company. Are we on the record or off the record? I can't tell because we're being recorded. Are we on the record? <laughs> We're on the record. I won't, I won't say the, the company. I won't say the company, but it's a company you know. Okay. Um, and and their, and their their post service came in, and they were telling me the exact same locations with the exact same numbers, maybe even slightly lower. Hmm. So there's there's very interesting themes here across lots of different industries and lots of companies, and and uh, and I, I think I think if I say it bluntly, I think there's like two kinds of people in the world right now, right? This is one Mm -hmm. way to think about it. There's people who are burned out and then there are people who know they're burned out. And so (laughs) that's, that's the categories. And so now we have to say, what does the research show about what you can do in that situation? We've got to trust this, the data that we have over the current paradigms that we have. Otherwise we risk making this situation much worse in Mm. our attempt to make it better and and i see a lot of uh, people doing that i've seen a lot of people doing it over the last year and a half through the pandemic they 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 double down on the dominant assumption and the assumption underneath it's taking me a while to be able to name it precisely but it's like Mm -hmm. something like if you want better results you have to work harder (laughs) Uh, that's it that's the simple uh, that's a very simple idea and of course, it's true in a variety of situations on your way up. You know, if my children aren't doing anything, they can make an enormous amount. I've got a child applying to university right now, and she can make an enormous amount of progress if she simply works a bit harder on that. Right. That's true. But it also runs out of its usefulness very quickly. It's only true for a certain point in time. It's what I call mm. the 10x dilemma which is where, you know, everybody listening to this, everyone watching this wants better results, even 10x results. 
but nobody listening to this can work 10 times harder. And that's the dilemma. So what do you do when you aren't getting the results you want, but you're already on the, you're teetering right on the edge of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. You're already engaged. You're already doing, putting in effort, putting in energy. Where do you go if you're running out of space? You need a new paradigm, a new narrative. Otherwise, you will try to do the 10x harder work and you will not get 10x results. You know, you will get this, you know, you'll, 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 you'll start to plateau or fail altogether. You'll burn out and still not get the results you want. And I think this is, this is a little bit of a my analysis to what's going on um, and maybe why these ideas seem to have relevance now. Well, wow. I could not agree with your analysis more because just even speaking anecdotally, it makes complete sense. We fall into this pattern and oftentimes, as you said, we are taught that hard work is rewarded. And many of us uh, ascend the ladder of so-called success for these very reasons. Our mentors, our institutions, the people around us reward us for this behavior of exerting ourselves to the maximum capability. And then we begin to learn, we begin to see what our unique capabilities and gifts are. And then we begin to double down on those. And eventually, Greg, most of us, if not all of us, hit that point where the same old MO doesn't work anymore. You've yes. essentially reached a point where, and, I, and, and so this is what I believe was so incredible, is so incredible about the work that you do. You offered that new paradigm. You offered a series of questions, tools, frameworks, beliefs that people could try on for the first time in their lives and said, listen, I understand you've gotten where you are because of the high performance that you've delivered. In yeah. fact, what I can tell you though, is the real, you think you are where you need to be? The highest performers in the world are not running around pursuing things in this undisciplined fashion. They, yes. they have found, and you did that, you found that thing that separated the 1%, and I don't mean to use this analogy in the same way that people are used to, but the 1% of performance and fulfillment that comes in work does not come from doing more, does not come from expanding more widely. And that is a incredibly difficult habit to break. Very difficult, and that's why your work was life-changing for me and for so many people, because the moment that they open the door and become aware of the dilemma that they're facing and that the old way is no longer going to work, they have to essentially reprogram themselves to become essentialists. <laughs> and that's very yes. difficult. <laughs> I love everything you just said. It's so precise and, and, and I appreciated the, the, the way in which you said it. The, the, I mean, this is the, the reprogramming is, is, I think is the right idea to get in, place and i think there are these sort of two paradigm shifts and and the first is is the essentialist framework which says only a few things are essential and most stuff is noise right um it's not my quote but it's a, it's a, a phrase i love uh, it's difficult to overstate the unimportance of practically everything that that that, that, that it's it's far it's so not true that everything is equally important a few things matter enormously and most stuff doesn't most stuff is non-essential and that's one of the big differences between essentialists and, and non-essentialists um the heroes and, and and enemies of our story is that a non-essentialist thinks everything is essential and an essentialist thinks almost everything is non-essential so it's a complete you know opposite view of the world and and as people you know as people start to remove the non-essentialist con from their thinking then then everything else within essentialism becomes that much more spontaneous natural and intuitive it's like waking up in the morning and you and you thought the whole life i've been in a coal mine yes. uh, and then and, and my job is to get as much coal from point A to point B as possible. 
and then you wake up I, the whole time it's been a diamond mine the 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 the, the, ma the, ma the narrative does not meet the reality mm -hmm. the narrative is incomplete uh the map is not the same as the territory and and so and that's true of course for all of us almost all of the time well no not almost all the time all of the time the maps and narratives in our heads are however true they are are always incomplete and so there needs to be a sort of a, a deep humility in that awareness so that you're just constantly in a listening mode and a, and a hungry to understand and to ask questions not forever learning and never coming to a knowledge of the truth to use that scriptural idea but 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 in pursuit of more truth and to never be fixed i've got it all now i have it uh, as the world keeps changing and we keep holding on to this frame that's false so that's kind of like you know that's one perspective and the one other i won't go into a lot of depth because we've already done it is is this shift between just do more harder work versus let's find an easier path and and and, and that I guess in both shifts, you know, this this you know non-essentialist and exhausting way on the one hand, and this essentialist, um, effortless paradigm on the on the other. Uh, I I would say, actually, I completely forgot what I was going to say. That oh no, I do remember that. The the one word that summarizes both of this is invert. It's that it's mm. so different. These two paradigms are, are more different than I realized when I wrote about them. It's like it, mm. as you teach them, as you talk to people, you go, oh, these are miles apart, miles and miles apart. And so, so differently, I, 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 this idea came to me recently that that's a bit like, um, you remember in Seinfeld, there's that old episode where, uh, you know, George uh, Costanza, I guess, right? He, he has mm -hmm. the opposite day. Do you even know this? Oh, Do you even know this yeah. reference? You know, one of my about. favorite. I know every episode. Yeah, that's so. And good. and and so he, you know, here he is. Everything, <laughs> nothing ever works for him, and he he has the off do the opposite day, and everything You're starts right. working for him. Just well, that's a little bit like what we have to do in order to go. You know, because what got us here won't get us there. So as as insecure overachievers who have learned some things that are true, but they're now out of date for our lives. Right. You have to invert the whole perspective, invert to see it oppositely, to see it completely differently, to invert it so that you say, instead of how can I get it all done, you say, how can I do the essential, you know, what's essential? Instead of saying, how can I force this? You say, how, how can I make this easy? How can I make it effortless? Mm. Is there an effortless way to solve this? Mm. And and because we have been trained in a sort of not trained, that's the wrong word, because there is a Puritan ethic deep within the fabric and culture of Western civilization. And, and it's done a great deal of good. But it's also, you know, like hard work is a virtue. That's true. But it's also said distrust the easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you take to that point, when you start to think, well, very true easy equals lazy and you don't don't have mm. want anything to do with it and that's one of my important inverted mantras is easy does not equal lazy right mm -hmm. just that once you can break that you open the whole world it's really tremendous what can happen because now what would happen what would happen what would happen in your life in my life and everyone listening to this if the trivial things became harder and the essential things became effortless i mean what would happen that's that's the combination of these two paradigms in a single question and 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 it 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 does change it it does it change it changes everything Ex exponential results possibly <laughs> or an yeah. opportunity to uh, have found a new operating system that not only recreates the previous results that allowed the person to arrive at the destination to make that decision but perhaps and very much so actually we have to assume 
a more effortless path to the same level of results, <laughs> a more yeah, focused, right. effortless path. I, I, I know from my experience that the greatest obstacle. So here we have this spectrum to simplify this, oversimplify this to, to illustrate the point of, of, of undisciplined pursuit of everything and being a non-essentialist and the disciplined pursuit of less. And yeah. this is a this is an incredible spectrum where what you essentially have is like a George Costanza that needs to do everything opposite he's ever done to break <laughs> the mold of the patterns. If he normally yeah. says yes to the meeting, he says no. Yeah. If he normally yeah. gets embarrassed when he's about to ask a girl out, he gets confident <laughs> and goes right up to her. You know, it's like everything has to be the opposite. The number one thing, I'm curious what you would say about this, the number one thing for me and for many that I would assume is the greatest obstacle to performing this change in their lives is fear. Fear is an incredible obstacle in every regard in life, whether it comes to fear of poverty and disease and, 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 and embarrassment. I mean, you can apply this everywhere. And what I experienced personally was when I tried this new system on, uh, figuratively, you know, mm. I had to break through so many fears that came up for me. How are people going to react? I'm always known as the friendly, nice guy. I am always here to support and encourage. Mm -hmm. I want to see people achieve their goals, so on and so forth. I mean, insert all the blanks. Uh, I got here by working hard. I <laughs> all this yeah. shit just over and over and over. Wait a second. If I do that, I'm going to look lazy. If I do that, I'm going to look like an asshole. If I do that, I'm going to look like someone who says no. Now, we'll dig into actually the uh, irony of all of this, uh, that actually we tend to respect those people with <laughs> more mm. than more than the ones that simply say, yes, we respect those people in society far more that are uh, how should we say, um, uh, a little more inflexible, a little bit more disagreeable from a psychological perspective. We, we value and, and people that are disagreeable tend to become more successful. But here we are, we have this disposition to saying yes, and breaking that is incredibly scary. Have you seen this much? Do you see this as a great obstacle? I'm curious what obstacles you do see for, for most people. Well, there's, there's many, many obstacles to this, but one of them is what you've described and there's like a, a bit of a mental model inside a lot of people's heads that that they either have to give a polite yes or a rude no mm. and it's this false dichotomy that those are not your only two options you can also negotiate and you can negotiate kindly and you can negotiate charmingly and you can negotiate you know uh with warmth i mean it, it doesn't have to be that that a no it, it, that that getting to a no has to be rude and and damage relationships i i just was talking to, to an entrepreneur of a of a very major company and um he, he, he actually so we came up together this idea of white gloved elimination uh, that, that if you if you identify in his case he was talking about customers that had been with the business a long time and had helped to make the business and then as the business has developed and grown and matured and and shifted its focus it, this is he, he feels constant obligation to just always say yes to any request these original mm -hmm. customers have even though the company is less and less well positioned to help them so the gap is growing and as we talked about this idea of white glove elimination, he started, it was, it was like definitely a breakthrough and it's not a term I'd ever used before until I was having this conversation with him. And that that's what's possible is in the middle ground. You, you, it is better if he can find a journey, a way for them to actually be served better by who can currently serve them. That is better for them. Uh, even if you have this transition period you have to go through, it is. and. It is better for him as well. And, and then the other thing I really want to hit upon is what's the alternative? <laughs> you know, I mean, this is the, this is Hell. the grandest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is the grandest achievement of, of the non-essentialism, you know, mindset is the, is the lie that you, 
here, here here's the lie if i can do it all i can have it all Oof. right it, can you do it all you can't do it all so that's like it's false right there you <laughs> cannot do it all what are we talking about in a world of infinite possibilities in, in an internet age where you have these uh you know just literally exponentially increasing the options of how you can spend time and how many people can reach you and through communication overload and opinion overload, you know, way beyond information overload. In that environment, you can't do it all. It's a, it's a total, so the basis of that idea is wrong. And but even if you could, so like I said, even if you started to approximate that idea, I'm going to do it all, everything anyone has possibly asked me to do, or thinks I should do or they're doing, does it give you it all? Is that what you get? Is that the world we live in? Is that reality? Because if it is, just ignore everything I've ever written. I mean, that's fine. <laughs> in fact, I joke like people should just double down on it. You know, just right. just don't sleep at all. Don't you know? Just just <laughs> go all out all the time. And and so once you once you see that non-essentialism is such a that we've been sold such a bill of goods that it doesn't do what it says on the packaging. Uh, then you start to go, okay, right. That's why I am stretched too thin at work and at home. That's why I'm busy, but not productive. That's why I feel like my day is endlessly constantly hijacked by people's agenda for me. That's why even worse than that, as a pandemic hits, you you're teetering right on the edge of exhaustion. You know, that's mm -hmm. why you, you want to make more progress, but you have completely run out of energy. It's like, yeah, this doesn't work. And the pandemic kind of proves it even where people have achieved good results look at the cost look at what's actually happening in your zoom eat sleep repeat life or you look at your fitbit and it says 300 steps by the end of the day you know like it is this isn't working uh you know to, to have this no boundary list this this way of trying to go forward in life and 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 so and so then you at least open your the possibility well, even if essentialism seems like it could be embarrassing, it could be challenging, or, you know, what will people think? It's like, yeah, but but they don't like non-essentialism already. Right. Like, that actually isn't working, serving them or you well, because you're just not doing a great job all the time. And they certainly, especially the people closest to you, they don't like it when you're constantly stressed and mm. constantly on the edge of resenting uh, any request that does come in. Uh, because you've got no buffer in your life. Every little wow. thing becomes like a pinch. Uh, wow. the, the, you know, that doesn't work either. So uh, so essentialism starts to be like a way out of the madness. You know, I, I think <clears throat> essentialism is a, is, a, is a helpful paradigm for trying to navigate these times. So, so many incredible, incredible points in there. One of the things that helps me, Greg, begin to transition toward this path was realizing that, first of all, as a person that had always said yes, what was the way that I could kindly say no or negotiate? And I learned this from you, but asking questions. I can't tell you how funny it is, the number of people who have a request for something, let's just say a request for coffee, a request for a report, a request for feedback, a request for look at my business plan. And then all you have to do is ask one single question and 50% of the time they don't even respond or follow up. The other 50, the other 20% <laughs> of the time they say, they, they realize that they don't even know why they're asking or what they want. You revert it back to them and the question becomes more specific. And then they come back and you negotiate a better request and you clarify the request and you go, do you need me to review your entire business plan? And they say, well, well, no. Okay, great. What would you actually like? What is the area of this that you need the most help with? Um, I don't know. Great. Come back to me when you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then they don't come back. So I eliminate 70% yeah, of requests by just asking some by questions. Asking a question. Asking a question, put it back on them, negotiate and understand what they want, and then determine do i want to do this so clarifying the request for me has been fundamentally helpful because then i get very specific about exactly what they want armand i need you to look at the headline 
of my de- of my uh, fundraising deck and tell me does this create the proper unique value proposition okay let me think I got this going on this week I got this going on let me look at my list let me look at my calendar you know what I can make time for that Friday evening before I unplug yeah I'll do that cool and I schedule it and I get it done and I don't feel bad I don't have resent or I go you know what Phil can we try in a couple of weeks? I'm head down right now on a lot of stuff. And they're like, sure, I get it. No problem. Did they actually need it today? No. Mm-hmm. When do you need this by? Another great question. Mm-hmm. When, do you actually, when do you actually need this by? <laughs> yes. You know, I love that, what you just said. And it, you sort of slightly framed it as if, as if that was something that you'd observed or gained from, from, from what I'm doing. But I still think the way you just put together what you described as uniquely yours and and I, and I and I love it it's a it's it is it is a simple it is a small sounding thing what you just said but it's a great thing to do in the pause right in that before you react to yes or even reactively ghost someone which is kind of two kinds of reactions you just uh, ask a clarifying question that, that's the that's the word that, yes. that I want to add to clarify the point. You don't just ask any question. You're saying, well, let me just clarify this with you. And because a lot of requests come to us so general, <laughs> so vague. Um, and, and I'm not saying all this to be to be critical. It's more to do with, well, it is a general observation of, of, of people in the world, right? Like... If, People are not good at saying what they actually want. And I, that's partially because they don't know what they want. And then even if they do, then they feel uncomfortable saying what they want. Because if you say what you want, then you can just be turned down and then that's vulnerable. And, and so for all these reasons, and then maybe just because they're so busy and reactive in their own selves, that they're just these things. I mean, I, I get an inordinate number of, of, of requests for various things. And and often it's very, very unclear. And so you're just generally going to get a ghosted response if you're not mm-hmm. clear enough. But yours is nice. It's a, it's a, let me just clarify. Are you looking for this or <laughs> this or, you know, can you, can you come back to me? Can you maybe write up some thoughts and come back I'm to me? I'm telling you, Greg, you go two, three layers in <laughs> and I'm most of them are gone after that level because they didn't, even they weren't even ready for the request in the first place they yes. were having a, a, a they were in their non-essentialism at that point and overwhelmed and oh, i should ask armon for the help on the business plan Shit. and and they're in that mode of chaos and they are throwing and and, and actually projecting and so what we find is like for for what i would yeah. say what sparked it for me was the pause the greatest thing that I implemented was, whoa, 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 wait a second. I am running on autopilot. And I think that that's good because I look like a high flying entrepreneur. I look like I'm getting shit done. Everyone's mm-hmm. yelling it at me, grind, hustle, get shit done. Let's go. Let's fucking go. You know, everyone's just on this like, you know, high energy thing. And I'm like, oh, that's how I need to also operate in order to achieve. But then I started pausing and actually literally breathing i mean breathing what a concept take one deep breath before you react and then one deep breath becomes three and it's like oh okay let me actually turn my attention back to what i was doing and come back to that later with a clear head and then all of a sudden you're creating space and space and space and you do things like putting white space for yourself on your calendar and then you can go back to those things and properly think about them that for me was one of the most fundamental changes in my life was creating time for myself, pausing and creating time for myself and not having fear that if I wasn't constantly moving and reacting, that I was upsetting people, that I was letting them down. And, and how funny to say that in particular as a business leader, as an executive, as an entrepreneur. At the end of the day, we all have our bosses, even an entrepreneur, they report to their customers in many ways. Sure. But But how funny to have that fear. Can you imagine the level of fear that other people have that aren't uh, necessarily senior level? And so they just react because they feel stuck. I'm, I'm curious on this point, what you would say 
to people who tell you that from a personality level, their disposition is rooted in more. Meaning, they're like, I'm a polymath. I'm somebody who actually thrives when I have variety in my life. And that's what gives me a sense of, I don't know, joy or fulfillment in my work. And my, my, my belief is that they could probably still be more effective if they were focused and essentialists. But I'm curious if you've seen that much, if people push back and say, that's just not for me because it's not my personality or what you see out there. Oh, I mean, first of all, um, essentialists, um, you know, essentialists uh, explore more broadly, more deeply uh, than non-essentialists. Essentialists synthesize better, are more interdisciplinary. Uh, they they are try, trying to constantly update their view of the world over a non-essentialist. And that's paradoxical, but that, you know, of course, doesn't make it not true. And, and the reason it seems to me is that non-essentialists are jumping into every new thing, every new trend in a very surface way. Reminds me of an executive who... I knew and, and, you know, somebody on his team told me one time, my goodness, today we came in for our staff meeting and the first 45 minutes was him talking about ergonomically sound keyboards because on the way to work, he'd heard that on a radio show and that was the thing, you know, like I'm, I'm going from learning to execution in a single moment and it will take over everything so this is uh you know this is this is not essentialism of course an essentialist is reading deeply they're not just reacting to the latest you know the the, the media feed uh they're not just reacting to the latest buzz in their phone they're, they're they're able to create space to read and to think and to study it's uh uh and and so you know, you think from a business point of view, you think Steve Jobs every day keeping his routine almost every day for 10 years for lunch, um, going with Johnny and sitting down and just brainstorming and trying to make connections. And Johnny's description of that is that they would just go through, well, what about this? What if, what, what if we did this? What about that? What about this idea? And there were just hundreds and hundreds of ideas most of them just nothing and then he would say it every so often one of us would say something and it, he said it would just like take the oxygen out of the room mm. be like yes that that's something and, and that's the idea is that you you do need to explore a thousand things in or in order to find the one so that's the other side of the steve jobs quote we all know right you know you have to say no to a thousand things in order to you know that's what focus is saying no to a thousand things it's like you've got to have a thousand things to say no to mm. and non-essentialists don't get to a thousand because they're, they're just going here's the next big one and here's the next big one and they're not actually thinking through the connection of everything because they're so reactive wow. and they're going so big on on trivial things that they, they aren't taking enough space to to separate the wheat from the tares you know that like that the wheat yes. wheat and tares are like literally when you if you grow grow wheat tares will grow together and at first they look exactly the same and so if you make a decision too fast then you'll cut the wrong thing down and, and so you have to let them grow to a certain point and then you go okay now i know what it is that's why the first pillar of essentialism is to explore what's essential <laughs> To create space for that and then number two is to eliminate the non-essentials to remove all the stuff once you know once you've you've got a point of view once you feel like you understand something new and you then you with some confidence say okay we're not going to do these other things i don't care that competitors are doing it we've done enough depth of, of thinking and analysis and synthesis and understanding that we think we understand what's going on so we'll say no to all these things we'll have a consistent strategy if we're wrong, we'll be at least we'll have been clearly wrong and we'll know what we decided mm. and why. And so we can correct it. That's fine, too. The non-essentialist is never doing any of that. It's just 
a perpetual machine of reacting to every latest request, what everyone else is doing, FOMO, the fear of missing out. And so you're never understanding the world better. You're just reacting to it. And I think that's, so I have, I have a lot of time for polymaths. Um, I, I mm. personally feel, you know, in the midst of a renaissance in my own life, reading and thinking, and uh, I want to un I'm uphold everything I don't know, even after, of course, 20 mm -hmm. plus 25 years of, of, you know, let's say fairly serious reading and writing and, and studying and thinking. Um, I still just feel the need to go deeper and to be more deliberate to create s serious amounts of space to do that. Um, so, yeah, anyway. Here, here, I thought that uh, that was going to sort of uh, pierce through the, <laughs> and you, and you, of course, have a counterintuitive answer that makes incredible sense. It makes so much sense. It's so true, and you know when something is true because we, we're very human beings are wired to, to really identify uh, kind of that that signal from all the noise. We know it, mm. we feel it inside. It completely makes sense. The variety that a person could get in their lives if they had the space to sit down and think and read and explore. And for, for myself, my number one value in life, like if I could, if money was no object, what would I do? I would sit in a giant library in Switzerland and go around the world and just learn, learn, learn for the sake of learning so that perhaps one day in a great conversation, I could have a nice exchange with somebody like you and be able to, to share ideas and create a new idea together. To me, that's, mm -hmm. that's what it all comes down to. And so I have actually gotten to a point where I position my life for that. I am constantly just optimizing for that. That is the question. And, and I think of it as a sense of it's, it's freedom. Freedom is being a hardcore essentialist and being having the ability to choose how you spend that time. Some people want to be makers and be crafty with that time. They want to use their hands, whatever they want to do. But it ultimately comes down to it's them. It's rooted in them. And in that quiet space, by the way, the same way Steve Jobs, as you described, in that quiet space is when incredible things come out into the world. Uh, Non-essentialists are never going to create life-changing, world-changing, cataclysmic you know, companies or ideas or works of art because how, how, how could they? <laughs> they're, they're just moving and reacting and piecing things together like, like Legos, but they never build incredible works of art. I, I would argue, would, would you not agree? Like all the great artists, all the great authors, all the great thinkers are essentialists to some degree. Yeah, I mean, there's there's all sorts of examples of this. As I, I mentioned, the Renaissance type experiences, I've been doing some, you know, some preliminary reading, going through the classics of, of uh, uh, you know, like Greek mythology and and, and Roman mythology, and, and but but also into sort of modern classics, and and then, if, if, I mean, like so, take an example, uh, like Michelangelo um, assigned to do the Sistine Chapel. Uh, he, well, the, actually, the story is quite interesting. He he said, um, he, like he didn't want to do it at first. No, that that's not quite it. He absolutely, completely refused to do it. Right. Yeah, that's more like it. Uh, he fought it. The, the, the Pope slash King that's asking him to do this, Julius. Uh, and, and like, he got locked in there. Like, he physically locked in and eventually escaped and ran away. Right? Like, so when we talk about you know, this, this great classic, this extraordinary, mm. you know, last now, you know, one, one of the great wonders of the world, so to speak. And uh, it, there's a lot more to that story. Well, the plot thickens because he goes, wherever he goes, whatever he does, I, mean, I don't, I don't know all the details and I don't know if we know all, all the details are known, but something happens to him, some sort of visionary experience that he has because he comes back voluntarily and completely changed his orientation towards it. So he wasn't trained mm. to do the kind of work he was being asked to do. Right. Uh, he was doing sculpture work, and this was this. He was not, 
this was not the thing. And, um, but now he had a vision of it. He had a completely change of heart. And this is, it was after that period that he, he painted the most iconic part of the Sistine Chapel where God is, you know, reaching his finger down, almost touching the finger of Adam. And that's, um, I went to the Sistine Chapel a few years ago, and and before that, I didn't I didn't know quite how that ceiling worked. That that's just a small portion of the whole ceiling, but yeah. that's the image we see on book covers and and on you know in advertisements everywhere. You know that that uh, that was completely fresh view of God and Adam for him, hmm. Michelangelo. He didn't see that before. He didn't know that before. He didn't feel that before. And it wasn't what other people were painting or doing at the time. It was a very, it was really different than the other artwork demonstrating similar parts of, uh, of Christendom, which was, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the early artwork, uh, you know, the medieval work is, is uh, in, in even coming into the Renaissance, of course, are just, you know, biblical passages of the world. And, and they were paid for by by the Catholic Church, and so so I mean, like a lot of that work you can see and compare, and it's really vividly different. So he's clearly actually seen something or experienced something, and you know, I just I just think when I hear that story, I just sort of think there's a lot of essentialist in that story. You know, that's mm-hmm. you know, I don't want to do it, and then and then as he's going through this process, he discovers something that is essential in the midst of the wrestle. And, and then he's able to be focused on this thing for, you know, it, it is a four year journey then to complete that, <laughs> that work of art. So that, I mean, four years is a long, long time to be working on it. Most of the time, not, not, not all of the time, but most of the time on that single piece of, you know, that, that single brilliant piece of work. Uh, and, and so, yeah, certainly the classics, I mean, that these things that, yeah, you, know, you 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 read the the Mona Lisa and how it works and why it works and and the 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 innovation that was being used to create the Mona Lisa, um, that was that was a you know that was deep deep devotion over many many years. That mm-hmm. painting went you know from place to place as he kept going layer by layer. It's done in many many layers. And so, yeah, I mean, you can't, I mean, you've got to have these, these painters are tremendous. Um, I do think that, I think, I think the greats were essentialists. I, I think that's right. Mm-hmm. And I, and I know that maybe that fo- is force fitting something to some extent, because you could look at their lives and go, oh, well, but, but these ways they weren't and in those ways we weren't, but none of us are perfect essentialists. So, yes. so, you know, it, but, but if you, if you say like what essentialism is at a deeper level, which I think it is, is doing what you came here to do, right? Mm-hmm. Like, because every, every, everything can be looked at in many, many different frames. And at the highest frame, it's like, okay, life, like purpose of life stuff. And it, eventually you have to, if you really want to answer whether something's essential or not, you eventually have to grapple with the next frame and the next frame and the higher, higher level, because everything's connected to everything else. So for me to know what to do today, what should be on my to-do list. I ultimately will have to reconnect with my purpose in life. I have to do that work. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, who says it's important? Who says it's not important? What Based on what compared to what? And and so I think that these, you know, what you see, it, it, what I see anyway, in these tremendous uh, thinkers and and artists uh, that created these classics is, is a determination to pursue, you know, that purpose and eschew other things and be willing to eschew other things, even when mm. it's the done thing. You, you know, I just saw Van Gogh's work, uh, one of his, uh, the, 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 uh, the lilies um, in the, um, I've forgotten the name now, but there's a very famous museum here in LA that, uh, that um, the, the, the come on what's the name of it but um i just saw it just just a couple of weeks ago and i just uh, was so touched by it i just couldn't believe how touched i was by it just kept on having to stand there and watch it look at it um i mean this this deeply troubled man 
Um, so much pain walking these streets of Provence, France, dying thinking he's been a failure, <laughs> turning this agony into breathtaking ecstasy, right? Like that's uh, that's that's really unusual. That's really really rare. Uh, that's not that's not the human thing, right? We normally represent. If we, if we want to put suffering into into symbolism, right? It, it, that's qu quite easy to do, and we would like to do that. But but he he wants to he he turned that suffering into light and hope, beauty, it's the astonishing vision of, of 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 the glory and everything around us that we miss because we're too busy. Yeah, this this uh, these these uh, these people, you know, it's a deeper way of thinking about. What it means to be an essentialist for sure uh but it doesn't make it wrong um so yeah i'm with you nihilism is a much easier response when you're <laughs> in the position that someone like a van gogh was it's astonishing to really think about i think what you've just illustrated really is the deeper through line to all of this it actually doesn't come down to time it comes down to obsession with the essential <laughs> because you, you're not seeing and, and even if we look at examples like da Vinci, who is one of, is is the great polymath, perhaps of all time. Yep. These things didn't happen simultaneously where he was sitting in his office, just constantly reacting and switching gears and responding to what other people said. No, he was purely obsessed with his craft and these things happened in phases as you said as you as you said even just the mona lisa occurring in layers if you look at musicians if you look at people like mozart the rituals that they had were obsessive the amount of creative time was endless because they were often in a state of flow and you could argue that mozart is something akin to what van gogh experienced as well they are essentially transmuting and channeling something from somewhere far, far deeper. I mean, to be honest, Greg, I've experienced this when I write this right. feeling that this is not me, the muse, the idea that I'm the vessel and I am going to focus on what is essential right in front of me because I know this is what I was here to do. And if I die next week, I have to write these words that's my filter every single day and people find that idea very unpopular and very unsettling for me it creates bliss it joy the feeling to to sit and marinate on existence and then take action on the <laughs> on the idea that i am here for a finite period of time and i have one chance to deliver and create from that place that is true that only i uniquely can deliver and not I in the sense of I, Armand the Great, but I in this present moment, what I am, whoever I am, the combination of my experiences, my environment, what I've consumed and learned, what I've been exposed to, and this whatever is coming through me, let it let it through. And that is what yeah. I think so many of the greats have, have done and continue to do today. Yeah, I mean, what's essential is not, it's not just something you select, right? It's something you detect. Um, mm. and that the difference I think is, is enormously important. It, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not what you do. It's what comes through you, you know, it's, that's, it's, and, and that, that sort of, I think a sort of a, a kind of serious humility, uh, that you're not really in charge. It's, it's very, it's very counter to the, to a lot of the, presumptions of self-help and and modern self-help of, yes. of you you are the captain of your soul and it's like well it's better for you to be than just to let someone else be i think that is true but that doesn't mean it's the it's the ultimate it's like a pen penultimate position the ultimate position is to let something much better than you guide you 
something something much deeper. I, I just had Simon Sinek on the on my show, the What's Essential podcast, and and one of the things we started riffing about was the idea of genius, and and it, he he pointed out that that originally the word genius was not a person; it wasn't personified by a person, the genius. But you know, the, you would say, "Oh, the genius was with you when you did that work." Mm. You know, the genius was separate to the individual. It, you know, it was over there, and sometimes it would it would enter you, and you would have it within you, and and then you could do this. And and, and you know, you use the term "muse." It's the same idea, and that's I think it's a it's a much much healthier view of genius mm -hmm. because the idea that it's within you is so fixed and 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 so self you know one self wide and one self deep you know i am right. the genius and i say i have it and i own it and i control it what well, do you you know i mean these uh i remember <laughs> sting right you know like from from the mm. police sting that the musician uh he said people have always his whole life have asked him you know so how do you make the music and he's like whatever i understand about it it's very very little uh you know the the songs are there what we're going for a run goes for a walk and suddenly the music is in him and a story is in him and it, 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 something is flowing through him and then what i think is makes the story even more believable with sting is that is that then suddenly it disappears the muse walks away and this is, let's say, 15-ish years ago now. And he said, since that time, professionally, what he's produced has been hardly anything. I mean, you'd think that's true, right? I mean, you know, Ten Summoners Tales and uh, you know, these things these things are, are a long time ago now. I don't know if you're a sting guy, but yeah. I am. I'm a big fan, um, especially so, the so, so, <laughs> Yeah. And, 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 and then something happened to him. And this is all interesting. This is more than he said, but I'll just extrapolate for a second. So, so Sting's accent, the accent everybody knows, that you know, that anyone who listens to Sting knows, that isn't actually really his accent. I mean, it's not his original accent. Because he's he's from he's from up in Newcastle in England, and that's he's a, he's a Geordie, and that's a, it's a, a the Geordie accent is a rich and I think beautiful accent, and it can be so hard actually. Someone who's who's thick enough Geordie accent would be hard for someone else in outside of Geordie land to 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 decipher, right? It can be it's very rich and deep accent, but for whatever reason, he dis he he separated himself from that accent and a close of sort of London um, kind of kind of kind of higher end accent, and so now in that little vignette. Is something interesting because he grew up um, with these massive ships that would be built uh, the down the end of the road. You can see photographs of them. It really is pretty extraordinary because they'll just like dominate the entire sky of the of the whole uh, area. Otherworldly to see these things be built, and almost everybody worked on those ships. And one time they had. I think it was the king and the, the the queen was on some journey through the area through Newcastle and and he saw he was in the window and everyone's watching waving and and as, as she went by there was this sense of like not only do I want to go with her but I'm going to you know like that's my world out there it's not over there with the ship and so he's gone on this gigantic world you know journey uh, you know, literally millions, well, not literally millions of miles, literally thousands and tens of thousands of miles from that world. And then eventually loses this muse. And it was only as he felt this sort of heart, his heart turning to these original, his roots, to his, his, like, metaphorically is is his ancestors mm. that he started mm. to feel music again and he said that as soon as he committed to writing the writing of the music about the people that built those ships uh as soon as he did it he described it, it's not i don't love this metaphor but he, but he said he said it was like he suddenly it, it was like he was almost throwing up 
with music. It was just mm. couldn't stop it coming forth. And that's where his musical The Last Ship uh, came from and, mm. and other music as well, uh, which is a you know, strong, powerful musical, met metaphorical, I mean, especially the song The Last Ship and the reprise of it. I, I love listening to those. I've listened to those many, many times. And, and, and so there's something powerful in that story, right, of letting uh, of, of letting your heart be turned towards family, towards ancestry, towards your roots, towards what a deeper story, a part of an intergenerational narrative that you're, we're all a part of. And that, and that role in being able to help us discern in our day today, the difference between the essential and the good or the essential and the busy. I mean, I mean, what's going to happen if we wake up one day and we just discover that 90% 90, 90 of the stuff we thought was important was not important? <laughs> and that changes everything. It's like really yeah. inconvenient, but like that happens. I think it happens to a lot of people. And unfortunately, a lot of people literally, it's on their deathbed yes. that they discover, they, they sort of have a, an inkling. And I don't know if it's just that they see the perspective of their life or that it's a more spiritual metaphysical thing that you just sort of just in the between between here and the hereafter that suddenly you glimpse oh it was about that mm -hmm. and i thought it was about this you know mm -hmm. a kind of a, we're coming, coming up into the the, the holiday period and it, maybe it's a maybe it's a, a christmas carol type thing but oh my heavens i've lived my whole life like x mattered and it doesn't matter what matters is this other work and it's work we have to do. And I think, I think really essentialism, that's, that's it. It's that rebirth again and again and again and again, as we, as we sort of take off the scales of non-essentialism. Oh, I thought it was that I, I'd been taught this, or I picked up this lesson and it isn't that this is the real purpose. This is what life is about. Uh, and, and it changes the whole, that's not, that's not incremental. That's like, that's like trajectory, totally different orientation uh and and you're like what else matters if you're headed in the wrong direction right that that's the priority is figuring that out mm. <laughs> i think that everything you've just described here in particular the story about by the way you're such a phenomenal storyteller <laughs> i oh, hope well, you tell stories forever and so that's a good. kind thing for you to say yeah, absolutely. They're easy to listen to and easy to follow along with. And they illustrate such profound ideas. The idea illustrated there to me, what, what I sense and what I choose to believe, these things are almost otherworldly. These things mm. are metaphysical. They're beyond. And I find that the people that have the most access to genius because i couldn't agree more that it does not belong to i or me uh, and that it is something fleeting that i must respect and admire and learn to cultivate and when it comes to enjoy and uh integrate with but when it comes it is really truly otherworldly and i choose to believe that it is because the more that i believe that i do find that it's more accessible because I have yeah. it gives me a, um, yeah. a a tangible thing to think about or tr attempt to place myself into in a realm of what is completely intangible. If that can make any sense whatsoever, <laughs> oh, of course it does. Well, there's there's three um, the the Greeks who had three words for for um, for like work. And two of them we're really familiar with, and a third a lot less so, right? So, so they had um, they had thesis, mm -hmm. right? Um, which we would say like theoretical work. Uh, so that's thinking work. Uh, then the next term was uh, was praxis, which is you know our term would be practical work. That's doing stuff. So you've got thinking type work and doing type work and that's pretty much what we have that's our western vocabulary for what for how it's how to you know, the kind of work you can do would be one of those two but they had a third and it's uh, psychosis and psychosis doesn't have a, a single word translation because it's not what we do but 
I mean, it's something like creation, mm. uh, but it's it's more than that. It's um, it's been translated as like uh, to come forth. Mm. It, it, and 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 that idea of coming forth that's neither you know i'm thinking about it i'm doing it is something else something can come forth without mm. i think i do well this thing just comes this thing comes this thing arrives this is and you can be a part of it but it's more like you know it, it's more like maybe the idea of being you know the midwife at, at you know at birth and like well the midwife is not doing it then it's, they're not but they're helping for it to be brought forth and i think it's a bit more like that that's a bit more like the the orientation and i i think it it does matter and and i think that i think that there's loads and loads of evidence to support this. If you, when you read the biographies of these people, when you think of, when you think of Newton and his, uh, you know, Principia Mathematica and, and you know, this, he basically went into a sort of solitary confinement for two years uh, to write that. <laughs> and. That's right. And it's, I mean, it's actually impossible that he did it. And I don't know why it's touching me so much, but it is. How did he do it? It's impossible, right? Like by, by any of our logical, you know, by a sort of reasoned ex yes, he went and thought deeply about this for two years and defined three laws. Of course, there are some exceptions as you get into, you know, into, into this, uh, more more recent um uh, extremities within physics but he still described in three laws how everything in the physical world works together including <laughs> the heavens right we're like we're like you know so far from even getting you know more than 100 feet off the ground and yet he's describing how everything works together it is it is an impossible thing. I think it's intellectually dishonest to say, oh, yes, he just, well, he did some good thinking there. You know, he just mm -hmm. figured it out. I just don't, he doesn't mm -hmm. believe that. He didn't, he didn't believe that. And he saw, I mean, we keep using this term metaph metaphysical, but he didn't see a separation between the disciplines. Right. He, he was, he saw the spiritual and the metaphysical and, and what we would now think of as physics and chemistry and so on. It was just all in, in mathematics. It was all just part of trying to figure out the world. And, and over time we've divided those disciplines and there's some good advantages to that, but I think there's an enormous disadvantage. I think mm -hmm. that, I think that I've been reading a, a book recently uh, by, I think his name is John Gotto. Mm. And he's a, uh, Man, this this one touches me deeply too. But he's uh, he was, I think I think I'm right in in re recalling it this way that he was the teacher of the year um, winner. You know, he's like the teacher of the year uh, award winner three times in a row in New York City, not in a row, but three times. Which I didn't even know you could do twice. I, that's like unbelievable in itself, so, so, right? But he, three times, and then he went on to be. I think the state teacher of the year twice. I mean, like, so this boy can teach, right? Like this, yeah. we know. Well, after he'd been awarded that, he wrote an he wrote an op-ed in um, Washington Post, I think, saying, "I quit." I think that's the title of the piece, <laughs> and he just couldn't bear any more to continue within the system even though he's as good as they they come right. within the system it's hard to find anyone better he just can't do it anymore he spends the next 10 years working on a volume um and, and i can probably find it here so that i'm i'm naming it correctly uh but he give me a second here is it here mm -hmm. 
I just put it. I just put it on the shelf today again. So now I now I'm. Uh, I don't remember the color of it, but the um, he he just he just he breaks apart the t- he re- he studies more deeply than anyone I know. Uh, us the down origins or weapons of mass instruction. Oh yeah, so you found that it isn't weapons of mass mass instruction. Uh, mm. Although it, it's, of course, in the same in the same league. What was the first one you mentioned? Dumbing us down. No, it's not dumbing us down. But right, like mm. he's the dumbing us down guy. Mm-hmm. He's the he's the guy, to my understanding, that gave us that gave us that phrase. Mm. Um, but he, okay, I can't find it here. But but it's uh, it's the origins of uh, the, the dark, sort of, sort of like the darker origins of of American education mm-hmm. system. And that doesn't sound like a super exciting book, but I I think it's so compelling. I when I started reading it, I it didn't take me long before I noticed my body slightly shaking in anger. It was really wow. vivid, and I wasn't wow. of course losing it. But he named so precisely a problem and one that I myself had experienced, especially when I was young. Um, but but also observe it for the world at large. He said if you wanted to make learning and education confusing to the point that it's almost not comprehensible you'd create the modern educational system oh god (laughs) so it's like it's like this division and separation of knowledge and and the disconnection between it and the world it's trying to describe so that students are never exposed to the reality or if they are it's very temporary and they're the things everyone loves oh we went on a trip and we went to this place and we saw the right. thing and we went to it and we and we touched it and we talked about it we actually understood how those ideas are in the world and it was fun and we were together and we had an adventure it's like yeah that's education because we're trying to learn about a real thing that reality is everywhere mm. around us and everywhere within us. We're trying to learn about this thing. And this thing we're learning about is not separate. The, 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 the chemistry is not separate from the physics. The physics mm-hmm. is not separate from the history. This is all one great body of truth and it can be all circumscribed into one great whole. And almost everything about our education system, dividing it by years and by age and by subject and by rooms and all of this, makes the thing almost incomprehensible wow you don't even know what you you don't even know you know you don't know what any of it means anymore and so and so it, it the, the the its value the value of understanding it of education is difficult to overstate but the the value of what we're currently getting oh it's so painful we started educate home educating our own children a few years ago and was just going it's, to no false, it's, that, it's no false yeah. modesty to say that we have not done a great job. I, I, I don't think we've done a great job. Um, and yet, I think they've learned so much more than I they would that. have done. 100%. Is that just, it, it, it's like, we just, we haven't been like, we, you know, we haven't been out there, okay, we're going to teach you all day and we're going to do this. It's not like mm. that. They're very like, you know, here's, here's the curriculums. Here's what you're going to do. Good luck with that. You know, it's more, a bit more like that. Um, we'll follow up with you sometimes, but you know, we got like got a lot of responsibilities. So, you know, good. My eldest, when she was applying to university, um, I said, you know, you might want to just write down the books you've read as a teenager, you know, just, just for your own sake. And maybe you put it in your essays and she stopped when she got to like 200. <laughs> and, um, and it's like, wow. it's, 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 it, that's a lot more than I was reading in 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 state school in middle school my my job was to try and not read that's that's yeah, what i thought totally so i don't know how we got there but we got there oh it's phenomenal beautiful and i think i i can't wait to read this but i think i found the one the yeah. underground history yeah, of american education it. The underground so history that, of american education that is a buy now uh, <laughs> along with all his other yeah. work to think yeah. that this this to uh, think that is. this incredible teacher it's a white cover found it now was so accomplished yeah to think that he was so accomplished and revealed uh 
this dysfunction at this level is absolutely wild to me. I have this crazy idea, Greg, um, <laughs> that my children, which I don't have any right now, but I, I, mm. I hope to, my children will be raised by the world. My children will be raised through the experience of joining me on adventures throughout life and society. Today, I'm going to go to a bar and meet up with Greg. We're going to have, uh, I don't know, maybe a cocktail or a beer or a coffee. And we're going to discuss everything we were discussing today. And you can sit there and you can enjoy it and you can tap into this. And this could be absolutely life changing for you. And the more and more that I do that just through exposure and the lessons that come from go and order your own food and go and experience this and go identify why that plant looks this way. Go Google this. And yes, there is the curriculum, but I believe that we have everything we need between the digital realm, which as we know is absolutely unlimited YouTube university and the physical realm of people, places, environments, and things that you can touch and smell and investigate to become a hundred times more successful and educated than I ever will be. I think that that approach will make my kids run circles around me. And I could be wrong. And God, am I going to hate it when they can just out <laughs> argue their way out of just about anything. And how incredible will it be, though, to have a child that you can sit and learn from? Wow. I want to learn from my kids. Why not? Oh, why not? Indeed. Uh, there's a, there's a biblical idea about that, a vision of that. But Stephen Covey, before Stephen Covey died, he was asked, um, you know, what, actually, it's really unusual. Somebody said, what's your legacy? What do you want your legacy to be? And he said, uh, what did he say? It wasn't like a normal vision statement that you expect. It was like, and a little child shall lead them. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, wow. And, you know, maybe that was to some extent him being, well, you know, towards the end of his life, he's not as precise as he was before in one sense, but in another sense, it's like this other side of like, yeah, but maybe he was seeing clearer in one sense. Like that's what he, he really saw was the, 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 the potential in, in children to lead. And, and, and like, I'm look, I just, I'm looking at this book right now. He said, uh, he captures this idea at, at the age of 12, Admiral Farragut, uh, Admiral Farragut got his first command. Twelve. There's loads mm. of stories like that in history. Mm. Of very young people doing extraordinary things. Yeah, there are. Right. But the problem is we, we have created an idea of teenagerhood. You know, right. you say teenager, what is a teenager? It's like we've created that. We fabricated that. 200 mm -hmm. years ago, they didn't exist. No, we of course, you could still be a teenager. But it, <laughs> yes, there have absolutely been kings and queen, queen, queens. But, but, but there were people capable of tremendous things at young ages. Mm -hmm. There's a story of uh, you know, Virgin's, uh, uh, Virgin Atlantic's, uh, what's his name, the, the founder. Um, you know who I'm talking about, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Richard, come on, Richard Branson. Richard. There's this story of him when his mother, who's, who by all accounts is what made made Rich Branson a a thing, um, is very strong coffee in her own right, and very yeah, well. One of the things she did, I think he was maybe no older than seven years old, where she dropped him off miles and miles from home, uh, no phone, of course, is way before anything like that, and just like mm -hmm. yeah, okay, your job's to get home. I think it took him like seven or eight hours to get home. Um, by the time he got home, he could do stuff. He knew mm. things. He knew he could find his way home. He talk knew that he could talk to people. <laughs> he could, he could, he, he, he'd figure, he, he had experience and we have to like give that to people. Uh, listen, listen, I'm going to read one quote from this book and then we can move from this. But he says, this is part of his author's note, his opening note. He says, the shocking possibility that dumb people don't exist in sufficient numbers to warrant the millions of careers devoted to tending them will seem incredible to you. Yet, that is my central proposition. The mass dumbness which justifies official schooling first had to be dreamed of. It isn't real. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? That's amazing. I can't That's wait amazing. to read this. 
I yeah. can't wait to read this. You know, Greg, so much of um, what we do in life, uh, in particular for me, and I imagine at least in part for you, is for ourselves to document, to teach ourselves, to create the tools, the principles, and the ideas that we ourselves individually need uh, to become the essentialist inside of ourselves, to make things more effortless. What has the journey looked like for you over time? And where are you at today with grappling with these ideas and implementing these ideas into your life? I can tell you are an incredibly creative, deep thinking individual and constantly testing these ideas. But I'm sure it comes in in waves like anything in life. And I'm curious what that's been like for you. Um, I mean, there's not a thing I write about that I don't fail at and struggle with all time. I, there are people, there are people in my life who are a, a better, pure essentialist than me. I would say my wife, Anna is my best friend. Um, uh, Sam Bridgestock, I would say is, uh, and these, these two people have had such a disproportionate impact on my life. I'm very genuine. I mean, of course I'm grateful for them, but I'm like, yeah, my life would be materially different without them having been a part of my life right and and that the just the groundedness in both of them that's that's to me is is impressive and helps you know helps in a sense has always helped me to be able to sort of fly and go and try and explore but also not you know not lose ground you know enough groundedness right what's the icarus story mm -hmm. right like the it's it's, it's you got to have that's been very helpful to me um i mean i think that we're having this conversation at an interesting at an interesting moment because because I'm I'm entering I haven't quite got the right word for it but it's it's like it's like oh yeah like echo that's a good word for it like an echo an echo of my you know like a, a reverberation a secondary and another whole volume mm. let me give it you know specifics um my daughter just went you know just just my eldest daughter just went to you know she's at the same university i went to when i came to the united states she was at byu now i was there and going back there it, it wasn't just surreal oh my goodness this has already happened and she's now there and and, and this is you know, full circle it's not just that it's i sense purpose in for me there i sense Oh, there could be a whole new. Th there were things I had impressions of back then that I thought were about. I thought, oh, I see what this is about. This is to help inspire me to get on with my life out there. And now suddenly I go, oh no, that was that did mean that, but it also meant this thing, a, a new phase of my life. Uh, there was a university in in uh, that, that I once went to many years ago, seventeen years old. I remember very distinctly. I've only been there once, and it was only for a couple of hours be half a day loved it every second i was there went with my economics class uh from my a levels uh and we, we went there and i remember feeling like oh i want to come here one day you know and i even took some gravel and we put it in one of these um you know the old photo um film containers remember yeah. the film containers uh used to put them in and it, i put them in there and i had it for the longest time maybe i have it somewhere still uh and then I, I didn't I didn't do well enough to even go to that university. I didn't ever even apply or anything. And so I just thought that's done. You know, that was just a moment. It was just an inclination of oh, you should aspire to do great things in education or to, to go to great universities. And, and, and I felt like, well, that's done. And now I find myself on the edge of exploring going to that university again, you know, and 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 pursuing education again. Uh, and it's like that idea that you can have glimpses of the future or a sense of the future that do actually mean one thing but mm. also in addition you find later mean a whole second thing mm -hmm. and that makes me think that that same little momentary impressions could mean a whole third volume a fourth volume or many many wow. volumes so that glimpse what you sense as a child or as a teenager oh this is this is significant in some way you know this is this is important in some way but you don't understand the layers and levels of importance 
So you're right in knowing it's essential. You got the idea, but it was essential in 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 a in re reverberating echoes uh, that 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 you can discover over time. I'm thinking here for some reason it comes back to my mind the most unbelievable story. I don't know if you know about this, but when Winston Churchill was a teenager, he read he wrote to a friend of his. Um, uh, he was a church was a Herovian. And if you haven't watched it, there's a really interesting documentary, um, mm. unscripted reality show, pretty much uh, of Harrow, mod the modern Harrow school. I found it really interesting. I, I didn't go to any mm. school like that. I, I was at a state school and, uh, but I thought it was really lovely. Anyway. So Churchill was the most famous Herovian. And, and, and when he was still, I think still there, I'm sure it's right. One of his friends, he writes to him. Oh, I feel like I ought to find the actual quote. The writer was Sir Merlin Evans. Uh, year is 1891. Um, he's in one of those dreadful basement rooms in the headmaster's house. It's a Sunday evening and it's after chapel evensong. And they're talking about their futures together. Uh, after placing me in the diplomatic service, uh, you know, um, he said. Uh, he, he said to Churchill. He said. He said, "Will you go to the army?" He said, "I don't know. It's probable, but I shall have great adventures beginning soon after I leave here." Are you going into politics, following your famous father? I don't know, but it is more than likely because you see, I am not afraid to speak in public. Uh, you do not seem at all clear about your intentions or desires. Well, that may be, but I have a wonderful idea of where I shall be eventually. I have dreams about it. Where is that? I inquired. Well, I can see vast changes coming over a now peaceful world. Great upheavals, terrible struggles, wars such as one cannot imagine. And I tell you, London will be in danger. London will be attacked. And I shall be very prominent in the defense of London. How can you talk like that? I asked. <laughs> uh, we are forever safe from invasion since the days of Napoleon. I see further ahead than you do. I see into the future. This country shall will be subjected somehow to a tremendous invasion. By what means, I do not know. But I tell you, I shall be in command of the defenses of London, and I shall save London and England from disaster. Wow. You're kidding me. <laughs> so how? Wow. Yeah, right. So so th th there's, you know, th this is I mean, he, he says, I mean, according to the account, you know, mm -hmm. I see further into the future than you do. I mean, he sends something mm -hmm. and it's. And I think it is absolutely possible. Achieve achievable, necessary, right, that 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 we that we're taught that when we're young and mm -hmm. and at whatever age that we're at and that we maybe even can even in our adulthoods reflect back to well what did i what, what, what did i even have any mm -hmm. impressions any visions early did i get any glimpses and maybe i have long since pushed them aside as immature it's not real, not 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 fit for the world. I mean, they've been they've been buried down and pushed aside and and not realistic. That's the word, isn't it? That's yeah. that's the, that's the you know that's the that's the dream killer. Yeah. And 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 maybe maybe there's a lot of substance to it. You know that that there's layers and layers to those impressions, and and in them we can we can start to, you know, as we said before, not, not just decide what's essential. Uh, we detect what's essential, detect our mm. essential mission. And, and, and then, then we're able to sort of not just try to make it happen, but to not get in the way of it happening, you know, to, to not let us be in the way of what's of what needs to happen. So, so we, we stop making decisions that make it harder than it needs to be uh, for that, uh, for that mission to, to be completed. <laughs> what a beautiful answer 
for something that most people uh, would probably say something along the lines of, uh, they'd probably end it right after, yeah, you know, I'm like everybody else. I struggle with these things too. Next question, sir. <laughs> you <laughs> you continue to just illuminate so many profound truths through these stories, through these lessons and what you're describing, what you're talking about accessing, um, first of all, I'm incredibly excited to see how that unfolds for you because you have a, a friend and an advocate in me to thank you truly help you accelerate and expand and proliferate these this next stage uh, of your life and the work that comes as a result of it. Um, I really look forward to that. That is uh, an honest statement because whatever this last epoch represented was already incredible and life-changing for for me and so many people so mm -hmm. i can only imagine what uh that looks like for you because it it's a compounding effort it's a compounding result i should say of these glimpses we have and these truths that can be revealed and i couldn't agree with you more that we all have access to these things but we tend to shun them away or uh, when we have that imaginative nature, especially as children or teenagers, people tend to laugh at them, dismiss them. Uh, and it's up to us to hold on to these things. And the fact that it comes in different stages in life, I think the, the real thing I'm hearing is take them seriously and grasp them with whatever you can and continue to, to follow that path of being an essentialist to allow them to come to to the surface. So thank you. Um, this has honestly been such an incredible conversation. Any uh, kind of closing thoughts just to bring it home and in particular for everybody, uh, anything you'd like to kind of end with or ask of them or how they can support you as well? The thing that you just talked about reminds me of a, of a, of a, um, of a vision. This is uh, most people have most people, even if actually most people haven't even read the Bible now. Right. Which is a shame because it's like the most cited book in all of mm -hmm. Western civilization. So it so it's like you can't understand anything else without understanding it, at least to some extent, because everything's framing it, it you know, everything's framed against it. But but another book that is even less read, you know, and, and people sort of assume they know what's in it is the Book of Mormon. And, and, and that is full of tremendous insights but there's a there's one that's a vision of one of the early um fathers in the in, in the story and he has this dream in the dream he sees what he calls a great and spacious building and this building like in modern mm -hmm. vernacular it's like twitter everybody inside the building is pointing and laughing at these other people who are walking on a very small, narrow path. It leads to this tree, uh, sort of a tree of life, a tree of light, this, this fruit, and it, it's really good. But anyone who gets there, it's just like really extraordinary what they, they're finding. And, um, but these people in the building, like, I don't know, I don't know what, I don't know why, I don't know, I don't really know what happens in that building, but they don't have much to do because all they're doing is pointing and looking at these other people who are in the arena trying to make progress. And, and so there's a lot in, even in that surface um, analysis of what's going on. But a lot of us, I think, you know, maybe, maybe the great spacious building is like school, like given mm. the conversation we've had, it's just people laughing at us for ever being different. The second you're different. Oh, that's funny. That's ridiculous. That's stupid. That's it's like, the weird kid in the room, man, that's like, you don't want to be the weird kid in the room. No one wants to be that. And yet, if you want to have anything like a working society, you need people, everyone to be able to be the weird kid in the room. You need them to be the weirdest, best possible version of their weirdness. And, and there's all sorts of subtleties in the, in this, uh, this, this dream, um, that, that are interesting, but, but among them is, is that there are people that even get there, they're eating this fruit and, and they'll sometimes, they, if they get distracted and start looking at all this noise, pointing at the belt, they'll like give it up and wander away and get lost. And that's, there's lots of tragedy in the, in, in the dream really, but that, that's perhaps the greatest tragedy. Like you actually found something 
and it actually was good and you actually did love it and you felt it meant something, but then you're put off by it because somebody else who isn't even there eating it. It's not like they're standing next to you eating theirs. They're not even eating it. They're just so, they're just so afraid mm. that they're just happy to be in a crowd, even though they're all doing a stupid thing. It's uh, safely stupid with everybody else rather mm. than on my own out there doing something that matters i think there's something in that story i have never really thought about it in explicitly the way we're talking about it now of of like that path that dream is that's the path of the essentialist there's a million non-essentialists out there they're willing to yell at everybody scream at anything just whatever because that they, 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 they've got not got better things to do they're, they haven't figured out what their essential path is and we just have to make sure that as we find that path that we don't just get wander off into strange roads and get lost and, 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 and give up something good. We found essential that we found I, that, that for some reason, that's really in my mind. And I just leave it maybe on that, on that point. Incredible. Thank you so much. I really truly have to say as an essentialist to be able to spend this time with you, for you to make time for me, for this, uh, it's it's an incredible honor. It's an incredible privilege. You're an awesome human being. I really appreciate your time. I right back at you, Amin. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>